All right, and now we are recording. All right, well, welcome everyone, uh, old and new faces, to the um, monthly EFF Austin meetup. They happen currently every month on the second Tuesday uh, at 7 p.m. of every month. Um, for those of you who are new and uh, have not been to one of our things before, welcome. Um, they're normally during non-COVID times held at Capital Factory in downtown Austin, but we are doing them virtually here for the time being. I would imagine probably at least another half year given the way things are going currently. So um, we will be here for the time being, but thanks for joining us. But for those of you who are unaware, EFF Austin, we are a longstanding digital civil liberties organization. We've been around in Austin for about um, 30 years. Um, we are closely affili affiliated with Electronic Frontier Foundation based out of San Francisco. Um, um, EFF, Electronic Frontier Foundation, is the nation's foremost digital civil liberties advocacy group. You can roughly think of them as the ACLU for the internet, but basically they help to protect your civil liberties in emerging technological spaces. Um, so um, we're, as I said, we're a longtime group. Uh, we've been around almost as long as them, 30 years in the Austin area. Um, and um, and um, basically we, uh, we fight in a similar arena that we tend to focus more on the education side than the uh, legal advocacy side. We always, you know, we're a tight ship that leans on the talents and passions of our volunteers and just trying to help people get more informed on these issues and advocate for uh, change on these topics. Um, so um, before I turn things over to our speaker, I'm going to um, just go over a few brief announcements and I'll also see if the community has any announcements. And um, I also just want to say, I see we have somewhat illustrious company joining us tonight. I see uh, Council Member Natasha Harper Madison has tuned in. And I'm humbled and honored that you have chosen to join us. Um, it's it's really an honor. Um, so I'll try to make it worth your time. I promise. <laughs> um, so first thing I want to say is that we will continue to be having monthly meetups uh, going forward. Next month we're going to have our longtime friend Owen McNally talking about. Um, the cybersecurity around health and medical data and just what's going on in that space right now. He has a PhD as an expert in that space and we're gonna hear from him and talk more about that. Um, we're also gonna be hearing sometime in the next couple months from our friends, um, Michael Running Wolf and Caroline Old Coyote who have presented at a few of our South by Southwest parties in the past. Gonna come talk to us about some of their current projects and work. I don't know the exact details yet, but I just wanted to let everybody know that they will be coming up. They're both a delight and I encourage you to hear whatever they have to say. Um, let's see, other things to let you know. Also, just if you're interested in learning more about our org, you can always go to EFFAustin.org. You can follow our meetups on Meetup, on Twitter, on Facebook, on our mailing list, your platform of choice. Um, so let's see, is there anything else major I need to talk about? I don't think, I mean, well, so one thing to be aware is that we are currently, the Texas legislature is in session and we are following that. I probably won't speak about that as much as I normally would because hey, we have Kathy Mitchell here who knows way more about all that than I do. And so we have her here to talk to you about some of the bills uh, in the digital solidarity space that are gonna be before the Texas legislature. Um, there, and there are a few that she's especially going to highlight as worthy of your attention. But I also want to draw a point to that our board member, David Hensley, has been doing write-ups on the various bills in this space, and they're going to soon be available on the EFF Austin website so you can uh, get dive in and, and find out which bills actually should merit your attention if these issues are important to you. Um, turns out, you know, this is an increasingly important space when it comes to legislation. David's flagged something like 90 bills somewhat related to this space. So this, you know, emerging technology continues to impact our lives more and more. And that's a part of why we really try to do what we do here. Um, and I think also um, one thing I just want to draw some attention to as well there is an ongoing campaign with EFF that we are currently running that I wanna draw your attention to, but it is EFF's About Face campaign, which is about trying to bring sane regulation on facial recognition technology to various cities around the country. I'm going to link the petition in the comments here. Um, we're trying to get signatures to show that there is interest in the Austin community for reform 
in this area. So let me just get the uh, petition here and I will link it to you. But this is a campaign we've been working on actively in collaboration with EFF. Okay. Um, before I turn things over, introduce and turn things over to our speaker, are there, does anybody have any announcements? Um, anything that'd be of interest to the EFF Austin community? Shameless self promotion is totally allowed as long as you know you think it's would be of interest or relevant to our community um law technology futurism cyberpunkery in general it's all fair game so um does anybody have anything they'd like to share before we get started david here um if so as kevin was the discussing i'm kind of working on a project to kind of make legislation more decipherable for everybody there are 112 pieces of legislation currently that I have filed, and there are more that are relative to this space. If you have any interest in providing input or going over the legislation or helping in any way, I would definitely not turn down any extra hands or eyes or anything like that. So I will drop my email address in the chat bar, and if you are interested, just shoot Yes, um, shoot, or you know, you can also always feel free to shoot me an email. I will just drop that as well for anybody who is interested in getting in touch. And I'm sure David will be providing his in a second there. Or if not, we'll, we'll figure it out if there was a technical problem. So uh, any other announcements before we get going? All right, it's fine if there are not, because I tend to ramble so we can actually get on with the main event here. Okay, so I am going to introduce our speaker here. So our speaker this month is Kathy Mitchell. Um, Kathy has uh, the honor or lack of honor, depending on how she may feel about her tenure of being a former EFF Austin board member um, and really was kind of our legislative knowledge uh, powerhouse. Um, and we're, um, you know, we uh, continue to stay in touch with Kathy because her expertise on this stuff is unmatched. Um, so Kathy is an organizer, a writer, and a grassroots lobbyist with more than 25 years experience promoting criminal justice reform at the Texas legislature, and she is currently working with Just Liberty. Just Liberty is a bipartisan 501c4 nonprofit organization dedicated to criminal justice reform. She conducts regular trainings for other grassroots lobbyists before each legislative session and assists to the Austin Justice Coalition's legislative team in the 85th and 86th sessions. She's on the board of Measure, a group dedicated to data-driven improvements to policing at the local level. She spent a decade as the policy vice president of the ECLU of Texas and the chair of the board of the Austin Harm Reduction Coalition. She helped launch the Texas Electronic Privacy Coalition, with which EFF Austin was involved, and has advocated for warrants for cell phone location data in each of the past three legislative sessions. And when I first asked Kathy to speak, we kind of had a very broad palette of we were like, well, you know, maybe you can talk about bills before the ledge, maybe you can talk some about uh, the criminal justice reform movements here in Austin as it relates to technology. Um, and basically, um, Kathy has decided since we do have limited time, can we talk about so much, she's going to zero in on several bills before the legislature that she thinks we as a community really need to draw our attention to because you know they're they're going to impact all of us and maybe you know there's some tweaks to those bills we'd like the legislature to make if only we knew what they are and what they're currently proposing to do so without further ado take it away kathy hi everyone some of you i know some of you i don't uh good evening uh, i am very impressed that you all have 90 technology bills on your tracking list. Um, I was not aware that there were 90 bills in your footprint and I feel like I need to go back and find all those bills. So I would I, love it if uh, you would share your track with me at some point, just to make sure that I'm aware of everything that's out there. Sidebar, I just first want to say that all David deserves all the credit for tracking all these down. So I want to give a big shout out to David. Uh, his work is phenomenal. You know, uh, nobody at EF Austin does this for the money. They do it because they believe right. in the cause and David's work there has been phenomenal. So. He wrote and you have to read the bills to know that they have something to do with your area. <laughs> yes, <laughs> which is one of David's talents. And Kathy, I'll just say absolutely that, um, as David said, I think 
he would absolutely appreciate uh, collaboration and feedback. He has a pretty exhaustive spreadsheet he's been working off of before he puts his write-ups on the website, but you two should absolutely talk because I'm sure he would love second eyes on it, as he has said. Well, I can say I was a, that was a big thank you. I'm very impressed, and I, I don't have nearly that many bills to talk about tonight. Uh, I did want to talk about a few um, that kind of, for whatever, for various reasons, they're all problematic and they're all likely to move. And really the, the, the plea that I would make to this group is that there is an enormous lack of expertise in the pink dome on issues related to, you know, internet policy, how server farms work, um, where you need to have privacy controls and where you don't. Uh, basically, it's, um, it's kind of a knowledge free zone up there. And what often happens in the, in the vacuum of a knowledge free zone is that all the information is provided by the lobby. Uh, I have the pleasure of officially being part of the lobby, but that is pretty unusual. Uh, I work for a 501c4 and we fundraise and it's very difficult to do specifically so that we can lobby. So we can spend 100% of our time and money on lobbying. That is not what's true of most organizations. Most organizations cannot do that at all. So you end up with uh, a handful of us who are trying to, you know, provide information uh, for the on behalf of the public, and then you have Google or last session Facebook, and they are not neutral. And they are not pretending to be neutral. Uh, there isn't a lot of pretending going on up there. They're very forthright about what their monetary interests are and how they need bills to look. Um, so far, they're not winning, so to speak, but they will be there in a much bigger way this session, I, I will guarantee. Uh, they almost lost some things last time in their in their view, in their world view. Um, and it was because they didn't understand the process that well and showed up very late. Uh, but they will not be late this time. So on that cheerful note, um, I'm going to do kind of a good things and then bad things. So I have been told, although it does not have a bill number yet, that the bill to require warrants for cell phone location data, uh, both, on, both live surveillance and historic, for those of you who've been following the cell phone location data saga through the courts over all these years, the courts have been increasingly making a distinction between uh, live surveillance and, and access to the historical record of all the places you've ever been in your life. Um, that bill we was heavily negotiated with a lot of help from the ACLU, uh, my organization, a couple of other community-based organizations, the Houston Police Department, weirdly, was very moderate in this particular debate. Um, and, uh, and the technology companies, uh, in that case, this basically the big servers. And um, we got that bill out of the Senate. It, we had a Senate bill in the House. It was moving very quickly. And uh, Google and Facebook stepped in and bigfooted it. Uh, that bill is going to come back. So the, it is my understanding that Senator Hughes intends to file the version that left that got voted out of the Senate and it will also be filed as a House bill. So 
the members who were engaged in this fight last time believe that they have a good compromise bill already and they do not need input from Google and Facebook. So it will be very interesting to see how Google positions itself, uh, what lobbyists they choose, how they decide to do their work because they would like to kill this bill. So for those who need to, who are interested and want to dig in, the bill number from last session was, hang on, Senate Bill 2093, and it will be the engrossed version. It will be filed again this session by Hughes under a, obviously a different bill number but it will probably have the same caption and it will be essentially the same bill when it's filed. So if you want to start familiarizing yourself with the bill, you can look at Senate Bill 293 from last session. Uh, Kathy, I have a few questions yeah. in the chat. People are curious about why people like Google and Facebook want to kill this bill. You know, that's the funny thing. Uh, they never said. Ah, interesting. They showed up in calendars. We had a so, you know, I think, you know, most of you are aware it is very hard to pass a bill. Yes, so for, good, have, for good and bad, it's very hard to pass bad. a bill. That's right. So when you have a Senate bill in house calendars and it's right at the end of session, you are in a desperate time. And most of how that process works is very much behind closed doors. So, all of us, including Houston police, the Houston police lobbyists who worked the bill, heard the same thing. That Google and Facebook showed up, said they didn't like the bill, and that was the end of that bill. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. I'm curious, Kathy, I mean, I'd need to dig through the uh, text myself. Does this, you were talking about the distinctions that these bills and the courts are increasingly making between live surveillance location data and historical. I'm curious if this bill also touches into the distinction between cell phone location data while it's held by cell phone providers versus when it gets sold to third party data brokers where there's currently almost no regulations around uh, police having access to it. Does this bill touch on that debate at all? I believe that the bill structure requires law enforcement to have a warrant regardless of who they're asking from, for the data from. Good, that's what I wanted to hear. <laughs> it was, it's a set of requirements on law enforcement, not necessarily a set of requirements on all of the different holders of data. So it, you know, it has some exceptions. It's not by any stretch the perfect EFF bill. So don't get, you know, if you read it and you freak out because there's a loophole, yes, this bill got all the way out of the Senate in Texas. <laughs> it, has, it has a few things that I wish were not in there, but all in all, it is much better than current law. And that's always where I try to, you know, remind myself that if we are lifting the bar, if we are giving people more privacy than they have today, then we get to have a little tiny party. <laughs> yeah, I mean, perfect, not the enemy of the good. We, we're engaging with the process here. <laughs> so please do look at Senate Bill 2093 um, as it at the engrossed version that left the Senate, uh, decide what you like about it, what you don't. Hughes hasn't filed it again yet. So if there are, they're, they are likely to be hesitant to make changes because they feel like they have an agreed bill, which is every member's like dream is that they have an agreed bill and it's just gonna sail. Uh, but if there's things that are critically important that we missed or didn't catch in the negotiation last time, you know, they would listen now. So that would be my first one to highlight. And it's hard for you all to know about a bill that doesn't exist yet. So I felt like I was safe jumping in on that one. I'm giving you something you don't know already. 
for your great bill trackers who've already looked at all the bills. Um, so then I'm gonna go to another one that is uh, something I know you all have talked about already. And I just wanna say thank you uh, for everything that you're doing. House Bill 759 by Harless creates a threat database for school children. It is completely absurd. Um, as you all know better than any, the existing model for a threat database is ARIC. And the idea that you're going to have random people seeing things that make them uncomfortable and reporting it into a threat database, and then you're gonna take that model and apply it to school children is just so remarkable that you can only think, someone didn't think this through. Uh, that was my impression reading the bill, especially the fact that the bill does not in any way written in a fashion like the author of the bill thought for a second about the issues of existing structural racism in our schools and how this database could exacerbate that problem. There's not even a hint this crossed the bill's author's mind. No, I don't think that's on Harless's radar screen. But she, I'm sure she didn't think about that for an, one moment. Um, but she also didn't think about a lot of things. I mean, uh, the the sort of saving grace because they're all they are starting to take a lot of heat for this bill. Uh, there are a lot of parents who don't want random people reporting their children into threat databases for reasons that they can't control or understand. Uh, Harless's response, uh, yeah, has been that um, that the information has to be uh, expunged when the student is 21 which mostly makes people go, that's terrible too. I, that, yes, expunge, but like the, so this bill could use, um, the folks who are fighting this bill, I will say this, are mostly uh, progressive teacher groups, which is good because, you know, not having teachers want to put children in a threat database was probably surprising for Harless. And, you know, that's, that is an unexpected quarter for opposition to come. Uh, but she's not really hearing from people who have a critique of the threat database concept. And that's where you guys could come in. I mean, we, we could definitely think of a few things. I'm, I mean, and also from reading the bill's language, from what I could see, it really seems like a lot of the justification of creating this thing is like, well, we're already doing this with paper records, so let's just make a computer thing to do it. What's the difference? And, and that's just like wrong on so many levels. Right. Yeah, <laughs> it is. That's right. And And again, Number one, she might not understand that. Number two, she's not thinking about it from a sort of systems approach that you all apply. I'm sure she isn't thinking, gosh, this looks like a small child version of ARIC and ARIC is a problem. Like she doesn't know that ARIC is a problem or why it's a problem. Right. And, you know, just to bring up something for those uh, who are maybe not as in this space as uh, me and Kathy or the people at EFF Austin are, one thing I brought up to Kathy when we were talking about this bill before everybody came in is just to give an example of like a major difference putting this in a computer database might make is, well, then it's not very long until a few years from now we have a bill that's proposing things like, oh, let's catch troublesome students before they cause problems and put a machine learning algorithm to work on this database. And so it can quickly snowball putting all this stuff into a computer when it's currently just paper files in a guidance counselor's office somewhere. It can snowball to some pretty unintended consequences that will just lock in so many of the current structural flaws of the public school system. So yeah. it's not the same saying, oh, well, it's the same, but on a computer, that, that's not how this works. Yeah. 
So that one is important. Um, the reason that it has momentum and isn't just a silly idea that Harless came up with is that there is and remains a great deal of hand wringing at the state under the dome about uh, school shootings. There are a lot of bills that have been filed about school shootings. Uh, most of them have to do with either more guns or less guns. And so the debate around school shootings has sort of stalled in more guns or less guns. And to her credit, Harless probably feels like she's trying to think out of the box. Uh, it is a very tiny box. So, so there's going to be a debate about school safety, about um, school resource officers, uh, adding school resource officers, taking away school resource officers. Some people think they're completely pointless. Uh, some people think they're actively harmful. So there is a, a very big and kind of stuck debate about uh, school shootings and physical safety of students from assailants. And the fact that the assailant could be another student has made this all the more vexed and stuck. And so when you have a really big issue that kind of causes voters to hyperventilate and you haven't come up with a good solution, who knows what will pop out of that mix. And so when, so I want, I do think that the Harless bill is, you know, worth writing something up on, communicating with her office, being very sciencey about it, you know, highlighting sort of structural issues. Um, and, you know, that this is not the solution. Yeah, I would agree. And we, we see this a lot, you know, um, in, in laws in general, but especially in, in emerging technology laws. I mean, everybody wants to keep children safe. Who could be against right. that? But, you know, this, this is a bill I would argue actually would put a lot of children at greater risk of bad life outcomes, not help them. So, right. you know, you have to, everybody wants to help kids, but you can't just say, oh, I said this helps kids. How can you criticize it? That's right. So I want to move to another, um, another type of bill. And there are several of these, but I'm going to specifically pull, call out um, one, it's been filed in both the House and the Senate. It's House Bill 818 and Senate Bill 530, making it a Class A misdemeanor to write something threatening on the internet. Um, so- Does it define what counts as threatening? Yeah, hold on, it as sort of, uh, it isn't, so it says the, the House and Senate version are slightly different. They're not an exact companion. Um, the Senate bill says that it's a class A misdemeanor to publish on an internet site, including a social media platform, repeated electronic communications in a manner reasonably likely to cause emotional distress, abuse, or torment to another person, unless the communications are made in connection with a matter of public concern. So you can't distress someone with your comments on a social media platform unless you're talking about, I don't know, Donald Trump, maybe. Um, I mean, yeah, the fun, you know, ones just so many vague words. Nothing is clearly defined in that. That that would right. be my immediate woe with that. Yeah. So real quick, the House bill is actually a little bit different, but it's you know very close. But hang on. Yeah, they got a question here, and I would assume this would be the case that the motivation behind the need for this bill is ostensibly cyberbullying. Yes, absolutely. Again, another vexed, unfixed, stuck problem that nobody knows how to address. Uh, this bill, the House bill, is by our local rep, 
uh, Cole, who is a rep in the Austin area. Uh, she probably my rep actually. Is, is this uh, is this Cheryl Cole? Yeah. Okay. So her version says it is a misdemeanor, class A misdemeanor if. Uh, you publish on an internet website, including a social media platform, repeated electronic communications in a manner reasonably likely to harass, abuse, or torment another person. Well, at so least it's a misdemeanor and not a felony, you know, that means we're not yes. dealing with somebody completely out there, which from what I know of Cheryl Cole, I don't dislike Cheryl Cole. <laughs> right. Well, and so that's, you know, again, we're, you know, this is Austin, Austin EFF. We're, we're the Austin tech people. Uh, it might be a good starting point to just go talk to her about this. Um, I don't know what EFF's current sort of stand is on bills like this that attempt to address cyberbullying by um, making it a criminal offense to, you know, be super rude. Right, which, I mean, not to minimize the real problem of cyberbullying, my, my initial gut is like, well, how do you criminalize being mean in very specific contexts in any way that isn't ripe for abuse of plowing a truck through? Like, that's my initial right. thoughts and worries. I mean, I don't want to speak for EFF. I do know the way they generally think about and attack this issue from what I've seen is they specifically focus on the problem of stalker wear, essentially, which is unambiguously wrong and messed up and a crime, basically. So they really tend to focus on, on specifically targeting people who install software unbeknownst to people that, you know, like jealous exes to track and spy on their exes. That tends to be the sort of reforms EFF actually pushes and advocates for because we've, I mean, to speak of, I remember there was a cyberbullying bill that came around a session or two ago. I don't think it ultimately became law because as you said, it's hard for bills to become law in Texas. But this one was like bad where it was like ostensibly trying to help victims of cyberbullying, but the way it was written, a victim who then said something mean back to their aggressors could actually get prosecuted under the bill. So it's just, yeah, not, it's just not thinking through the implications. Like how would this be enforced? Like uh, whose legal obligation is it? Is it the social media platforms? Because we all know content filters don't work and they're broken and they flag things they shouldn't. So, you know, it's, once again, I, I sympathize with probably where rep, uh, Cole is coming from, that there seems to be this really impossible to solve problem that I'm not saying isn't a problem. It is. But, you know, and I don't necessarily know if I have a magic solution uh, for sure, Cole, but I'd at least want to make sure she is thinking about the possible unintended consequences of this bill. I mean, I, you know, I definitely think it has First Amendment problems. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that. I mean, uh, yes, yes, you know, it turns out we have a right to be mean to each other, to even if that's jerky. Yeah, I know, right. Um, but I also think that if there is some narrower um, thing that EFF National has said, well, this is an okay thing to do. I mean, these members are, again, addressing a stuck point. We are at a stuck point where people, you know, ordinary people want there to be something you can do about this. And things like the First Amendment say, uh, you know, not really. Uh, and, but lawmakers routinely just make a new criminal law. Like that's their go-to place. At the bare so, minimum, uh, I would just hope for extreme narrowing of targeting. Cause like, I remember, I think it was last session, there was the infamous uh, dick pic bill, but at least that one was incredibly clear about this is the offending thing. Do this and it's <laughs> illegal. There was no ambiguity if you had violated this or not. Yeah. Yes, this is much more ambiguous, I agree. 
So again, this is the kind of thing where even without a write-up or a fact sheet or something, you know, members of your organization could approach Cheryl, just call Cheryl Cole's office and say, look, you know, we're the Electronic Frontier Foundation. We'd love to talk to you about, you know, House Bill 818 uh, and, you know, understand what you're trying to do and maybe help you do it a different way or do it using different tools or something. Uh, because again, she's got constituents, they care about this, uh, people are mad about it. All right. Or, and, you know, and I think really we can all agree this isn't the right solution. Yeah, and I mean, you know, the key I think is, I'm not gonna tell somebody who's a grieving parent because of a child who was cyber bullied and had something tragic happen. I'm not gonna tell them there isn't a problem and that right. they don't deserve some form of justice and remedy of the problem. The question is what's gonna actually help and solve that problem and not make a bunch of other unintended problems and hurt other innocent people in the process. That's what we're trying right. to figure out here. And I'm, yeah, it's not an easy problem. If it was, somebody would have written a bill for it all. Correct, exactly. All right, so we've been here for a while. I wanna do one more before we stop. Um, this bill is, a res I believe, and again, I'm a bit reading between the tea leaves because I haven't visited with Nelson about it. Senate Bill 475 appears to be a serious and quite possibly bill that can pass level of seriousness um, effort to address the ransomware attacks on state and local government since last session. So I assume that everybody here in this educated audience is familiar with the ransomware stories. And I guess I'll just do a sidebar for those who don't know, though I'm sure everybody here does. Ransomware is basically when hackers uh, infect a computer network, usually some kind of government entity or some major infrastructure entity like a hospital or a school or a utility company, et cetera. And they basically lock down the OS, encrypt everything, and basically say, if you want the passwords to unencrypt this and get to the files, send us a bunch of cryptocurrency to this wallet. Right. If you don't do that, then we will nuke the hard drive and you'll lose all your data. Yeah. So it's, because, and it's bad. And the, the only real defense against it is to make regular backups that are not connected to the internet, like back up your whole system. That is the uh, known way to mitigate the problem. Just a lot of people don't do that as much as they should. Well, that's the kind of thing that you should go to Senator Nelson's office and talk to her about, because uh, there's several things that jumped out at me about this bill. Uh, and the most, the biggest one for me is that what it appears to do is create a framework for somebody somewhere to figure out what to do, and then everybody have to do what they say. And I get that because the ability to navigate who, who, you know, uh, the, the, the agencies that were affected by, um, by the ransomware attacks in the last couple of years in Texas were entities like the Office of Court Administration. Like they don't have the right skill set. And probably that's why they were vulnerable to ransomware attack. And I think that she is trying to create a um, a set of bureaucracies that everybody can learn to rely on and be taught to rely on. And somewhere in the bowels of these bureaucracies will be somebody who, like Kevin says, his job is going to be to say, you need to back up your files on an independent server. And here's how you like that's, you know. And maybe there is a less uh, gnarly approach. I guess I would say. Um, I think that if there are some things that could be, that government could be directed to do, nobody wants to not do those things. I think they just don't know what they are. 
I mean, uh, actually, this is one where unlike the other things we've been discussing where it gets philosophical, this is a problem with a known easy solution, what I just said. <laughs> like, this is what every cybersecurity professional will tell you to do if you don't want that to happen to you. Right. So it has, a, an, and again, this gets to um, the bill is designed to allow a lot of information sharing on the premise, as I read it, that in order for all of these different entities to collaborate in this new kind of bureaucracy that's being created, there will be a need for a lot of information sharing. And then there's a whole section on uh, sharing of personal information of individuals that frankly authorizes way too much information sharing and especially to law enforcement. So uh, there's, they're creating a bureaucracy and then creating loopholes <laughs> in the new bureaucracy for the very things that we would want to protect. But I will say that I don't believe that this is anything other than not knowing how to handle a big problem. Yeah, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't sound malicious to me. It, it no. just sounds, and you know, at the same no. time, Texas, actually, we can even point to a recent sort of bureaucratic S solution like this that did not go very well, which was that uh, the last legislative session actually uh, authorized the creation of a commission to study da data privacy standards. But basically, due to COVID, they used that as an excuse to not have any public meetings, even virtual meetings, listened to a few industry insiders and their perspectives, didn't get any consumer perspective, and basically spat out a report that looked like somebody hadn't studied for their final exam and wrote it all the night before. Uh, yeah, so the fact, this idea of let's get a commission, uh, Texas doesn't have a good track record on that recently, so I'm not sure that's the right, right. approach we want to go here. Yeah, so I would strongly encourage you to A, take this bill very seriously. Um, there aren't very many uh, go-to people who lawmakers go to to get stuff done. Nelson is one of those. Uh, she controls the purse in the Senate. Uh, which means that if she decides that this is what something she wants to fund, it can be funded. Um, and so I think, you know, taking it seriously, assuming good faith, assuming again that there's a real problem to solve and nobody's really figured out how to solve it and we don't have the right talent in the room, this is a moment when this is kind of a niche opportunity for EFF and for people that you all know for your networks to sort of dig into this bill, read it, understand it on its sort of on its face, go talk to Nelson's office, offer your expertise. You have people with credentials that their office would love to have. They'd love to build a bill that folks like this group it would agree, would think is a good bill and then be ready to go and testify for. Awesome. So it's, you know, it's an opportunity and it's necessary. Like Nelson filed this, I'm sure, because she feels like something has to be done. We can't have the Office of Court Administration losing all its records thanks to ransomware and Texas does not pay ransom. <laughs> Yeah. Um, no, I mean, it is absolutely a problem that needs to be solved. And uh, yeah, ransomware is a big problem. And uh, fortunately, uh, there's a solution to this problem. Um, I, I mean, I mean, just to give uh, a new kind of scary phenomenon escalation in this thing that I was hearing about just the other day, actually, there was a municipality in Florida that just put out a press release that uh, hackers got into their municipal water supply and upped the concentration of sodium hydroxide in the water right. supply to dangerous levels. Yeah. So yes, these sort of bills are increasingly going to be essential if we want to keep our cities safe in the 21st century. Absolutely. So that's kind of, that's really all I had. Um, there are obviously 90 more bills. 
<laughs> well, you flagged the ones that were most on our radar, but as I said, there will be write-ups coming. Um, but, you know, we've got plenty of extra time. So if anybody has questions for Kathy about a specific bill she has or hasn't talked about, I want to encourage you to go ahead and ask those questions. I know at least one of you does. And there is my dog. <laughs> Just one second. <laughs> Cyrus. Hi, Cyrus. Haven't seen you in forever. Hey, Kathy. Good to see you again. Uh, Kathy, I see on my Facebook, it was six years ago today. I was at the Capitol lobbying about cell phone location. You were my tutor. You got me set up with lobbying. So, Oh I'm, my God, can you believe we've been trying to get that bill passed for that long? Well, I was so sad to hear this more uh, just now at the beginning of the talk that it's, it's back in the news. I was shocked to hear that. We didn't prevail six years ago, but there was the Carpenter decision from the US yes. Supreme Court. Right. But so apparently this, that's not enough. So the Carpenter decision applies to the seven days worth of historical data. No, old historical data older than seven days. It has been interpreted extremely narrowly by law enforcement. Sure. So law enforcement is now basically taking Carpenter and saying, okay, we have to, if we want to know where this guy was, you know, for the past month, we can, we can look for the past seven days and then kind of see what we think. And then we can get a warrant for the remaining rest of that time. And uh, that was predictable. So, and the end Carpenter did not include live surveillance. Okay. So they don't, so weirdly, um, Carpenter has had the impact of requiring a warrant for the piece, the pieces of the data that arguably, you know, like, I don't know where I was a month ago, seven o'clock on Tuesday a month ago, like, blah, I don't know. Like, it's hard for me to feel how personal that is. I'm sure if I saw it, I would be like, oh yeah, I do care about you knowing that. Uh, but, but like active surveillance, I feel my, you know, my little feelers kind of go up. Like, ugh. Sure. So the compromise bill that almost passed last session addressed all of those zones. It picked up where Carpenter left off, used Carpenter as a framework, and then made it kind of apply broadly. Is there a, a combination of people from the left and the right still interested in protecting oh, yeah. this privacy? Okay. Absolutely. Um, I mean, yeah. Carpenter, we hailed the decision at the time. And of course, as these people always do, they found loopholes around the decision. The big one I alluded to earlier being that Carpenter just applies to the actual cell phone companies themselves and the data they mm. gather. As soon as that data is sold to a third party data broker, law enforcement can access it with no warrant. And that is the big loophole law enforcement is currently using to still track all our movements. And what he said. <laughs> and yes, it's a problem. And uh, the Supreme Court, I, frankly, I'm like, you guys didn't catch that hack? Come on, you're paid a lot more than me to think of these things. So now we're gonna have to go back to them at some point and be like, come on guys, fix this. Well, and well, let me just make a quick plug. If anyone's looking to learn how to lobby and Kathy's interested in teaching you, she's wonderful. And this is a terrific issue to talk about. Go into the legislator's offices and tell them in clear yeah. language. They want to hear from you. And um, it's just a blast. It's one of the funnest things I did in my life. And uh, it sounds like there's a chance to do it again in Austin. So I live in San Diego now. I won't be joining you, but go for it. <laughs> Yeah. Hi, Kathy. Earl Barg. Earl, will, nice to see you again. Good to see you. I'll reiterate everything Cyrus said about learning from uh, Kathy how to lobby, and it really is a lot of fun. My question, though, is for Kevin. Kevin, do we expect to be working with the ACLU on issues this year? Uh, we hadn't currently reached out, but considering Kathy, I believe, has contacts there, we'd certainly be interested in working with them if they were interested. So they... Um, my guess, so they're spread a little thin. Uh, there are way more police bills than there have ever been ever. And they're struggling to cover what is frankly kind of a new base for them. They haven't been that active in that arena, but now they 
they're jumping in and that's good. Um, yeah, and given what happened last summer, I'm sure there's a host of horrifying bills being proposed that they're knee deep. Yeah, right, in, and sure. they're and they're deep and they're deep in all the voting bills, and you know they have they have their priorities. I would say that uh, they will probably be involved in the resuscitation of the cell phone location bill because. They add, just like Cyrus, they were also working that bill six years ago. <laughs> so they have history on it. Um, there's, they will probably weigh in on, a, on the, the threat assessment of school children bill because it's really like got everybody's, everybody's a buzz about it. Um, and, and they might weigh in on some of the others on your big list, uh, depending on kind of what the issues are. So yeah, I think it would be worth reaching out and it would be probably Matt Simpson. I think I do have Matt Simpson's email. I do think I've spoken to him once or twice. If I don't, I might ping you about that, Kathy, uh, facilitate an introduction, but I think I have his email. Um, and Earl, I'll just also say that, you know, certainly uh, if you want to work with us on potentially reaching out to some of these offices and, and raising some of the community concerns, we'd, we'd love your help. We'd love your volunteering. So feel free to get at me. You have my email, particularly, uh, you know, work and just life and surviving these days gets me spread pretty thin. So anybody who wants to take on any of this work, uh, please do so. I'm not stopping you. Uh, do we have some more questions for Kathy? I really encourage everybody to pick her brain fully because you, she is an amazing resource uh, on all stuff of this nature. So I have a question for Kathy. Actually, I have a long list of questions for Kathy, but like, I don't even know if I have that list developed yet, but so I'll stick to one. Um, I don't know if you are aware of or have read or done any research into SB 12, 112? SB 112. Yes. It, um, it basically, uh, it, it requires an affidavit um, from a law enforcement officer in order to use a tracking device um, on a suspect of some sort. Yeah. And I'm, I'm really having a hard time trying to figure out is that, I mean, is it helpful in that it just adds another buffer to the process of being able to so track this, people? Yeah, so this is a good bill. Um, in order to put a tracking device on you or your car, the law already requires a that you have to file an affidavit with the court. It's a it's a little bit different than a warrant per se, because because specifically that affidavit is based on reasonable suspicion. So all you have to have is reasonable suspicion that criminal activity has been, is, or will be committed. And the problem with that is that reasonable suspicion is an extremely low standard. So what this bill does is strikes out reasonable suspicion and requires probable cause, which is essentially the same standard that you would have to have to get a regular warrant. And that is completely appropriate if you're going to be, you know, sticking a tracking device on a person or their vehicle. So and, uh, actually, I'm glad you flagged this for me because I like this bill and we should, it's, it's, a, it's a good step. And I just also for those interested in legislative history, I'll just point out the only reason that it requires any kind of probable cause or anything at all for the police to put a uh, tracking device on your car uh, is thanks to a Supreme Court decision in 2012, United States v. Jones, which was basically about cops planning a tracking device on somebody's car. And, you know, they didn't need a warrant. The, they lost that case because they vastly exceeded the scope of what they could possibly justify as necessary when they only had reasonable suspicion and not probable cause. But before that case, there were even fewer rules. So this is another place where Fourth Amendment is trying to catch up with modern technology. Absolutely. And I will say that it's probably because of that case that this bill has a chance of passing. You know, if it's clear that the courts are already starting to like shake their heads about these paper distinctions between this kind of affidavit and that kind of affidavit, 
And then at the bottom, the question is, shouldn't you just have to always have probable cause? You know, that's the way the courts are going very, very slowly. Um, you know, that gives this kind of wind under its sails to just make it clear by statute. Thank you so much, Kathy. I was having a I was having a hard time deciphering that one, even though it's not. Yeah. Um, another bill that I wanted to kind of bring up just because we were discussing cyberbullying earlier, and I just put it in the uh, chat. HB 129 is um, a bill to establish a citizen digital a digital citizenship credit in um, educational curriculums, and um, I feel like you know based on concerns on how cyberbullying or having your free speech threatened on the internet may be going, this, you know, seeing how this is taught in schools and kind of shaping and making sure it's being taught in a decent and effective way, I think it's a good first step towards solving the long-term solution, so. Yeah, um, actually, this is exactly the kind of thing we were talking about. This gets us out of that stuck place, you know, that if, if the real issue is that people are kind of clueless about the impact that their barrage of bullshit has on those who have it show up on our phone screens and we're receiving that and there's a way to make it part of how we sort of teach, um, that's certainly worth considering. I, I agree that it, it very much flips the axis where the focus isn't on uh, teach people uh, how to protect themselves from being abused. The focus is on let's teach abusers not to abuse people. This is right. true in all sorts of places and it can apply to cyberbullying as well. That's right. Yeah. So yeah, th thanks once again for raising that one, David. Appreciate it. We have more questions for Kathy or other bills people are interested in. Well, I can do a screen share and we can just like pull them up and look <laughs> at them together too. I know we're, we haven't been doing that, but. Well, certainly if there's more uh, on David's list he'd like us to go over, we certainly can do that. But I actually have one I want to flag for Kathy because it's partially a useful question for me and our potential lobbying efforts that I'm sure Kathy will have already researched know the answer to, which is, Kathy, what's the most effective way to meet with and lobby our legislators during COVID? Because the normal procedure of going to committee hearings and signing up as a witness is all screwed up right now. Right. So um, it depends on who you need to talk to. So for the most part, Democratic offices at the Capitol are closed and, and Senate offices are closed. So in order to reach Jane Nelson's office, you will need to phone them. You will need to ask for the staff person in charge of that bill, you know, Senate Bill 475 about, you know, protecting Texas from ransomware hackers. Um, and you will probably end up doing the entire engagement on Zoom. It's not terrible. Uh, the worst part is that they don't have to call you back. Um, a lot of the, particularly in the Senate, a lot of the offices have just left their phones on voicemail. And so you leave a voicemail and like you're just sort of luck of the draw if you get a call back. Uh, I would guess if you're very persistent, you will probably eventually get a call back. Um, would you would you recommend calling the offices over emailing them? Are you still more likely for yes. success with calling? I believe that calling over emailing is always better unless you know the person already. So in order to get that first, you know, who in Nelson's office, I do not know who in Nelson's office is staffing Senate Bill 475. Once you have you know, gotten, left your message and left your message and left your message and somebody has finally called you back and will tell you 
which staff person is in charge of this bill and help you make an appointment. And you get that first face-to-face -face Zoom call with that person and you can ask all your questions. After that, email is fine. But what I'm missing here is- knows who you are and you can email back and forth with that person directly all day. Well, what I'm basically hearing is you need some of the same persistence you need to get a COVID vaccine scheduled, basically. <laughs> oh, God, I hope it's not that bad. <laughs> so, I mean, and I guess, Kathy, this is something I may sidebar with you later, but if on any of these bills we've already touched on, if you perhaps already know the magic email, any of those you could send our way might be appreciated. Just because I'll call yeah. 30 times, but you know, if I don't have to, that would all. I know that the Austin Justice Coalition has been in Harless's office, and I think maybe my friend Faith uh, has been in Harless's office today. So I may be able to get you the right person in Harless's office on the threat threat assessment data space for children. And any help you can provide is, of course, always appreciated. But other other bills like these other ones, um, um, yeah, I guess I probably know who you. Right. And I yeah. guess I just want to say, since uh, Council Member Madison is having to leave us here, I just want to say thank you so much, Council Member Madison, for joining us. It really is quite an honor, and I just want to encourage your. Oh, well, she left. Okay, <laughs> I was going to say, please reach out to us if you need more help on any of these issues. <laughs> All right. Um, sorry, you were saying, Kathy. I forget. <laughs> Do we have some uh, more questions for Kathy? Oh, I was going to add one more thing. Um, most Republican offices are open. I'm so not surprised. Democrats, Democrats and all senators, but House Republicans are in their offices and they have their staff is mostly in the office. Now they're only there right now on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. That's the other trick. Um, the house is meeting Tuesdays and Wednesdays for the next couple of weeks. They have to start meeting more than that soon, but that's what they're doing right now. Gotcha. Um, and I guess, I don't know if you know the answer to this, Gabby, but if say I decided that lobbying on one of these bills was a uh, important enough and it involved a House Republican, um, am I going to be turned away if I show up wearing a mask? Am I going to be laughed out of their office? <laughs> no, not at all. Okay. Um, so the routine is that in on the North Lawn, there are tents where everybody who goes in the building gets a COVID test. Okay. So it's the, it's the quick test. It takes about 20 minutes. Um, you are, once you pass the quick test, assuming that you don't have COVID and that it's not a false positive, well, it doesn't matter, it's a positive. You get a positive test or negative, I'm sorry, whatever. You're yes. clear, you, yeah. you may enter the building because you do not have COVID. Right. Um, then it's basically just go in and you wear a mask. And once you get into the offices, it's office by office as to whether people are wearing masks or not. Gotcha. gotcha. Ah, yes. Ain't it a fun legislative session? <laughs> yeah. It's different. Mm -hmm. We have some uh, more questions for Kathy. I can probably invent a few more uh, before we wrap up here. We have the, this is the one of the nice things about virtual. We aren't kicked out at nine. We can go as early or as late as we want slash need to. And I will let us go early if the appetite for questions dries up, but um, I will probably be able to think of one or two more if other people don't have them. There's one I want to kind of bring up in the space. Um, it's called HB 273. And it's uh, related to establishing a pilot program for the issuance of digital identification. So it's another one of those database bills. But one of the interesting things about it is within the pilot program, there will be a, um, a citizen uh, pilot program version as well as a law enforcement uh, pilot program version. So I just wanted to bring that up and kind of get you know, make sure people knew about that. Kathy, if you have any insight on that or knowledge on that as well, much, much welcome. 
Um, yeah, this is definitely outside my usual scope. Um, this is the kind of thing that a lot of members, a lot of members will want to know what you all think about this. Like I wouldn't be the I, only one looking at this and going, huh? Th this is Heather and um, um, I um, think it might, I could be wrong, but it might be related to the link that I'm going to put in the chat room right now. Sorry about the animal, um, which is this 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 health related digital ID that is rolling out in 2020 about um, basically to help people in certain parts of the world that don't have access to things like passports or driver's license or like ways to identify themselves. And um, I have mixed feelings on it, but it, it's also related to like immunizations and vaccines and things like that. So I sent you a link if you want to do a little bit more research on this. I'm not 100% sure if it's connected to this bill, but this is um, a big push that some major organizations like Microsoft are are um, are pushing. Uh, Microsoft, Accenture, uh, Rockefeller Foundation. So, I mean, I've been keeping my eye on this for um, for about a year. Well, I mean, anything that has to do with um, with identification is going to be something that I would want to know kind of how you all think about it from a privacy perspective and how the immigration groups think about it from a, um, from a documentation perspective. This appears to relate to driver's license. And of course, you don't have to you don't have to be a citizen to have a driver's license, um, but the nuances are not something that I know a lot about. Um, so apparently, I mean, again, probably not related to the bill, but this idea, uh, the idea of a digital ID, a lot of these groups are saying that, you know, that this is a fundamental human right to prove who you are. Um, and that we need a trusted way to do this in the physical world and online world. That's some of the language that they're using on this particular thing. So, I mean, maybe at some point the EFF Austin can bring up this issue of digital ID um, in the near future, because it's something that I'm certainly interested in. And I haven't looked at this HB 273, so I'll, I'll dig into it and see if I can find any hints of what I've been researching lately in this particular bill. Well, Canales is chairman of the Transportation Committee. This bill amends the Transportation Code, which tells me without having dug into the specific you know, chapter that it's probably about driver's licenses. Um, and it's it may very well have immigration benefits. I don't know what those would be right off, but um, but Canalis is typically pretty sensitive to that. So I might put this on my list just to ask Canalis next time I'm talking into um, Curtis as his chief. Um, and whether or not some of this is connected to, to, you know, to voter suppression and, you know, showing your ID and whatnot uh, when you go to the polls is something that I'd be, um, you know, I may be jumping <laughs> the the gun on it but <laughs> but um you know the idea of identification in texas um is fraught with a lot of yeah. political um tension exactly too. exactly and typically canalis would be somebody that i would trust on that front um no i'm very curious about this too thank you for flagging it and um i might make a phone call and see if i can get someone to tell me what this bill does and I guess just I'll throw my general thought in the uh, ring here real quick that, um, yeah, the issue of digital identification is fraud. It's all devils in the details and implementation. There's some means by which it can potentially be a good thing, um, you know, facilitate access to services and rights. But in other ways, it can be a nightmare for privacy of poorly done. I mean, we in a sense all 
since we all already have a form of digital identification called our social security number, which is the most poorly designed, least secure digital identification you could possibly have. Literally anyone can memorize yours and give it to anyone else and you'll probably get away with the fraud. So we already kind of have it and it's poorly designed and it's terrible. So I'm not in theory against bills that propose let's build a better social security number, but you have to do it in a way that respects privacy and autonomy and doesn't promote uh, human rights abuses of various kinds. So yeah, devil's in the details, whether I would support or oppose a bill of that nature would really depend on how well it's been designed and thought through. Uh, let's see. <laughs> and of course, somebody, in a con uh, Cyrus in the comments are pointing out the, uh, yes, the wonderful point that, uh, that yes, the way they're phrasing the pro argument definitely sounds a little propaganda, -y, which makes me skeptical. So good point. <laughs> So y'all, I feel like um, I underprepared. I was, didn't prepare enough material for a two hour discussion. Well, that we have up to two hours. I've had people wrap up up to 30, 40 minutes if that's all they had, you know. So don't feel like, yeah, if, if we've kind of exhausted what people want to talk about, that's fine. I, you know, the this grows and expands with the topic. And also it sounds like uh, the dog is uh, ready for us to be done too. But yeah. Um, <laughs> But yeah, and I guess just, um, I, um, I don't know, are there any final thoughts in general on the topic you feel like imparting or sharing, Kathy? Um, well, I will say th that in terms of opportunity, uh, there are a lot this session. Uh, the change in speaker has resulted in change in committee chairmanships um, almost across the board. There's hardly any of the old chairman have their same committees, which means that people who don't know that much about the topic area that they're in charge of are sitting in chair slots, means they are anxious to have input. Um, it doesn't matter what party they are. It doesn't matter what party you are. Uh, at the end of the day, they have problems they have to solve in a very, very short period of time and when you have all of these new chairmen who've never dealt with these issues before, their staffs are gonna be looking for people who know something about something. Uh, and people who are not uh, there because they have a financial interest in the outcome are particularly handy. You know, you guys are a credible messenger who you're not showing up because you're being paid to do so or because your company is gonna benefit from the outcome. You're showing up because you actually know something about this and you'd like to see it done right. Uh, those kind of people get heard and this session, I think you can get heard even more than normal. And I guess I just would like to build on that and emphasize that if you are somebody who's not very involved in EF of Austin, you're not on the board, you're not a regular volunteer, hell, maybe you don't even come to our meetups very often. I just want to give you the permission to empower you if you care about these issues to reach out to these people as well, because you know we're, we're a community organization, as Kathy said, and we do what the community and people feel passionate about and want to do. I always joke that like, uh, if, if this was somehow EFF Austin, a scheme for uh, self-enrichment or uh, something, we're doing a terrible job at it because this thing just has only drained my resources. <laughs> but really, we encourage you to feel empowered to uh, take a stand on these issues. So by all means, if you want to coordinate and advocate with us, by all means, you know, my email is available, please email and reach out to us and say you'd like to help out and volunteer. But also if you're just the kind of type who's like, well, I don't know about that, but I still feel passionate about this stuff and want to email my rep, well, do that too. Nothing's stopping you. So I, I you know, a lot of why we do these meetups is to remind people that uh, this, your society is not just an archaic black box that nobody knows how it works. There are real people pulling known levers that impact your life, and you can actually impact that machine. It is not just some obscure, scary thing over there that does unknowable things to your life. So please get involved in the process. Absolutely.
If anything, you can just call them up and just say, hey, tell me about HB 273 and see what they know or don't know about it. <laughs> That's right. That's absolutely right. Uh, I've gotten a long way walking in the door and just going, I don't understand this at all. And sometimes you learn something useful and sometimes you find out that they don't really understand it either. And then you can start from there. All right, well with that, I think my dog is going to bell. So I think I'm ready to call it. And I think we've exhausted everything, Kathy. I want to thank you so much for coming, Kathy. You're welcome back anytime. And I know that uh, the reps, uh, they've already left, but I just want to thank Councilmember Madison again for uh, coming. We're very humbled and honored she came. I also saw uh, Chaz Moore as the head of Austin Justice Coalition was here. We're honored he showed up. And uh, Kathy, you know, I, I always am trying to reach out to AJC saying, you know, collaborate. We want to work. So definitely feel free to keep relaying that message to AJC that we are here as activist allies and would love to help in the good fight. Yeah, no, it's good. Chaz was interested. He came, you know, he's a really busy guy. I was Oh, I know. Surprised. I know he's a busy guy. I was honored he showed up. I've been wanting him to come to one of my meetups for years. So the fact he finally came was very gratifying. <laughs> all right well as i said dogs rebelling so i think i need to call it uh thank you all so much for coming we'll see you next month as always feel free to uh reach out email to us and get involved and thank you so much kathy i will probably be in touch annoying you with emails because i know you're very busy but i always appreciate any time you can give me free and mangus advice. you can email me too i'm very curious about your 90 bills so far the ones you've shown me are all quite interesting. i'll connect you and david okay Dogs dying. Gotta go. All Thank right. you, everyone. Bye, everyone.